So kind of the premise of the conversation has a little bit to do with some of the experiences I had this year and also kind of sparked my interest again when I saw the video you guys had put out showing the reaction time and just what deer mm -hmm. are capable of doing in a short amount of time. And a lot of the discussion seems to happen around people discussing does speed benefit you or not benefit you when you're talking about just general deer hunting shots of which, you know, a lot of guys are shooting 25, 30, 35, maybe even longer. There's a lot of variability, a whole lot of factors that go into it. But what it seemed like to me, not a whole lot of people have really talked about as much is, is there a benefit to speed on really short range stuff? You know, we're talking 10 yards, 15 yards, 20 yards and in, does speed give you an advantage in that type of scenario, ignoring the further out stuff? And so what I had done was looked at a bunch of footage that I put together on deer that I shot where I knew my exact speed. I knew the exact distance of the shot, uh, 60 frames per second. So I was able to get a pretty good resolution and just kind of run the numbers. And I also had the, the trajectory data. I had all of the speed data, you know, velocity decay data for all the bows I've been shooting. And so what I was able to do is on deer that had jumped the string, put together a pretty good window of here's about the time frame where they start to move. Here's about the time frame where they reach max string jump. And then kind of depending on the speed of the projectile factored in the speed of sound and like when they actually started to hear the bow go off, how long it took them to react based on that sound, right? Because as you guys well know, and I'm sure a lot of people watching know, if you get shot with a bullet going the speed of sound, you're not going to hear it coming. You know, yeah, right. if, if the guy's shooting the guns are fantastic like that. Right. If you got a crossbow that we're shooting, you know, 550 feet a second, which I don't think it even were quite that fast, the bolt's halfway to you roughly by the time you actually hear the crossbow go off, right? Mm -hmm. So to kind of, I guess, explain the concept in extremes, if you were to shoot a deer with a crossbow 500 feet a second at one yard, could it get out of the way? Well, of course not, right? But right. You oftentimes hear the argument, well, because we're not shooting the speed of sound, it, not, none of it matters, which on the other extreme isn't, I don't think, true either. So that's where we kind of get into the weeds on some of the discussion. The commonalities that I saw is that when deer jumped the string, and it wasn't an absolute, when they did jump the string, it seemed like after the sound reached their ears, it was about 0 0.08 to 0 0.12 seconds before they started to move. And then from the point in time where they started to move until they reached max duck, was about, you know, two tenths of a second. So we're looking mm -hmm. at from the time the sound reaches their ear until the time they're, you know, full on the ground, about 0.28, give or take a, you know, a few hundredths of a second. And, and in that zero to 20 yard range, depending on the speed of the bow, especially when you start talking about either trad bows or guys that are really pushing speed, there was quite a big difference, uh, especially in that, you know, 10 to 15 yard range for a lot of projectiles. And it's interesting for me because when I look at my bow speed and what I've shot over the past couple of years and what I tried this year and also compared it to my recurve setup that I also hunted with and also my wife's setup, she's shooting about 200 feet a second and wow. look at what is that critical point where I can reliably shoot a deer and not expect them to move that much. And maybe that allows me to say, Hey, I'm comfortable with a certain shot angle because I know I can place it exactly versus, well, that's kind of in that range where he might affect the shot placement quite a bit. Maybe that's 22 yards versus 14 yards uh, or whatever mm -hmm. the case may be. But I think it's important information to know based on a person's setup because that can, I think, help inform the shots that you either take or don't take or maybe where you aim. So I have a couple of clarification questions. The, yep. the, the data is all yours from deer you shot. Correct. And, and yeah, good point to mention that too because, well, a uh, funny thing, all the deer that we've shot hunting with Sam, none of them reacted more than like an inch if anything and mm -hmm. i've had some deer do that myself too but a deer i had shot with a recurve this year jumped the string as badly as any deer i've ever had jumped the string before at like an 18 yard shot and so again that was kind of like what kind of caused me to dive off the deep end here and put all this analysis together and mm -hmm. in the south when we got you know smaller body sizes on average maybe that's different i don't know that the reaction time would be different because that's you know, physiological, maybe it is, maybe it's not. Uh, but certainly I would imagine that a bigger physical body size animal, in addition to being sure. a bigger target, maybe it takes them more time. It's to get more mass to move too. Right. 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 And then I can the whole... tell you from hunting in Texas my whole life that depending on what part of the state you're in and then the size of the, of the property and how hard it gets hunted, you can have drastically different results. 
the down south of those guys are have you know 50,000 acre ranches under one fence and they don't hunt the hell out of them you can stalk them you can stalk whitetails and they're pretty calm you get over here in the hill country Fredericksburg, where everybody has 250 acres and there's a deer stand on every corner of every fence. You like reach out and hand each other coffee across the fence because <laughs> everybody's got one on the fence line. Yep. Those deer, there was a place I hunted in Fredericksburg and we stopped bow hunting on November 15th because it wasn't even practical. You had no idea where you were going to hit them. And I'm talking snug, 15 yards. They were so, all, they were so keyed up we just had stopped doing it and we started calling them rifles. So it's an interesting, it's cool that they're all your deer. That's, that's cool data. Are it's they cool. all in the same place, Garrett? I mean, location wise. Across either in woods or I would say semi open habitat like marsh um, or okay. grassy pockets within hardwoods, but nothing that's out in like a, an open food source. You know, acorns perhaps, but not like, you know, pick cornfield. All of my data is from a very small pocket and expand the data set and maybe get different results. I think that's just important to, to note. What I put together here is by no means absolute. And the more data that gets put into metrics like this, obviously the, the more informative yeah, it will become. Sure. I have a I have a theory that I want to talk about, but I want to uh, see your data first and and then uh, pose a different kind of thought process on this. I think, but let's uh, let's not do that yet until you tell us, you know, basically what you found out, and uh, and then we'll go from there. Sure. So, so I have the data set pulled up here, and this is kind of an expansion off of the the work I had done over the summer, where I looked at a whole oh, yeah. bunch of metrics. Which I mean, it's a, a different discussion. Um, but just looking at some of the sound travel time information I put together, I tried to bracket it into green is like they're either not moving or it's so negligible it's not going to matter and this like greenish yellow hybrid is like they're, they're starting to move the hides flinching they've maybe made it an inch two maybe three but really your, your shot impact is not affected much and then the yellow range is kind of like the beginning to the end of the massive amount of movement from mm -hmm. you know the start of string jump to the end of string jump and orange is the approximate time that they would be, you know, kind of rebounding into the, whatever the next move is. Uh, so the, the yellow portion is that real unpredictable time and the orange, I mean, once you get to like the end of the yellow and the orange, that's like the point in time where on this graph, it's max variability. If, if they don't move, great. But if they do move, I mean, you, you could be shooting at a totally different uh, point of impact compared to where your pin was. Sure. What he means by the orange, and Garrett, correct me if I'm wrong, is the deer has dropped as far as it can, and it's getting ready to spin or do something else. Yep. Right. So we're, is that what you mean by the orange section? Like, theoretically, they're sitting still, but they're getting ready to go some other direction, or they're going to come back up. Yeah. Yeah. The like orange, when, they're still moving at the maximum rate. Or the well, yellow, excuse me, I'm sorry. Yeah, you could say, I guess, max speed mm -hmm. is, you know, mid-yellow. And that would be maybe an interesting thing from a penetration standpoint too. max velocity that that target is moving when your arrow makes contact. Yeah, uh, of course. Because once you get to the orange, they're not really moving again. They're like, you know, between mm -hmm. they're shifting their, their, velo or their, uh, their direction. Direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, Garrett, a question on this, can you determine from these data, how far away the arrow is from the animal at any given time? Can you back, so can you look at it from the point of view of the animal and say, okay, we know that the, that the arrow in, at the end of the green phase is uh, 10 yards away from the animal. And can you compare that for all of these cases? I think you probably could if you, if you dug into it enough, but I think kind of where you might be going with this and what I found just kind of by looking at it so far was that all of the the data that I looked at was consistent enough to make me believe that they were likely reacting to the sound of the bow going off itself, as opposed to some distance, some common distance where the arrow is, you know, in relationship to the animal. Um, because okay. even when I looked at my traditional uh, bow setup and the flight associated there, when you play that thing back frame by frame, it's like that deer just sits there, sits there, sits there. And then it seems like 
you know, you get to a certain point away and that deer just, you know, totally, you know, flips out and, and ducks the arrow. But at the same point in time, some of the compound setups, it was like at the same distance, it maybe seemed like the same. However, when you factor in the uh, time it took for the sound to travel there, it was like, I couldn't really separate the sound travel time from when the bow went off versus like when the arrow was a certain distance away. So that was a bit of an okay. unknown. Um, maybe if we okay. get more, more data at like, you know, 20 yards versus 40 yards, then yeah, right. True. Sure. Yeah. Might be able to split well, that I'd out. Like to, but... Yeah. I'd like to, I'll take the data set and kind of parse through that. If you don't mind uh, yeah. at some later time. Uh, one of the, the reason I asked that is one of the things that Troy had told me about was an experiment that uh, one of his friends did where he wanted to see, uh, and I think it was pigs that you were doing this on, but he turned, he turned 90 degrees to the animals and shot his bow to see what the effect of the sound of the bow was on their, you know, their, their uh, uh, flight, fight or flight kind of response. And it, it turned out that the, the sound of the bow, if it was 90 degrees to the animal, really didn't change the, uh, they didn't really react. But when he turned and fired the, the bow, towards the animal that, it, that they did react. Is that, am I saying that right, Troy? Yeah, is that what I've done, a multi, I've done it on deer too. I've shot the other direction back when I used to have a place where there was always going to be 10 deer showing up yep. and I didn't care. I put a target out there literally and I shot the other direction. And they, they just went like that. There was none of this. There was none of, they didn't run off, which was yeah. amazing to me. And then the other thing I've seen with pigs is, but since they're herd animals, they all jump. Like, it's interesting. Multiples of my videos, there'll be three pigs in the frame. You're shooting at one of them, and they all, they all, they're all doing the same thing. Like a school of fish. Like a school right. of fish. It's just like they know. And I think, can't prove it, I need to learn to speak deer. They can just tell us. <laughs> I think they hear the arrow. I think it's both. Yeah. I think I, it goes funk. And then here comes something. Yeah, I think I think I would agree that there's probably a both component, and I kind of have a, a similar observation to it sounds like what you commonly see when shooting at pigs. Mm -hmm. When I shoot at a deer, if there's other deer around, it's like they all are in sync. They're yep. all reacting yep. at the same exact time. They know. And and even the, the first buck I shot this year, there was a button buck standing, I don't know, five yards away from him maybe like mm -hmm. a yard or two closer to me, but like facing the other direction. So, the, you know, there's a five yard distance of separation, you know, of, he probably didn't hear that vein the same way that the buck I shot at heard the vein, but they were both, yeah, sure. they were both dropping in sync and that button buck was leading the charges. They were both running away. So I think there's more to it uh, for sure. But I, I do think there's maybe a, a dual component it, at close range. Maybe it, it doesn't matter as much, right? Uh, because regardless of if they hear the arrow or the bow, like it's still happening fast, but I think is interesting. And I don't have any experience with this, uh, but the guys that I talk to that take those really long shots, uh -huh. they tend to tell me that it ends up being about the same on average as if they would have shot they jump. as if, as if they would have, you know, been 40 yards away in, in such a yeah. way that, that maybe they hear the bow and they, you know, they make some kind of a reaction, but it's not extreme. And then before the arrow hits, they, they duck indicating yeah. that it probably was the sound of the arrow more so than the sound of the bow in those. Yeah, instances. that's, uh, I wanted to talk about that uh, a little bit later and postulate a, a theory about that, that we could, uh, we could at least discuss. Um, but I don't want to do that right now. I'm, I want to wait and hear sort of more about your data set and, and what you're thinking and, and actually probably would uh, do well to compare one data set to another one here on this chart and kind of uh, give everybody an idea to acclimate to what you've got up here. Can you do that? Like I see you have a, you probably have some compound data up here on the left-hand side and a trad bow data looks like on the, uh, on the right-hand side. Can you, can you kind of compare those extremes and tell us kind of what we're looking at here? Yeah. So I have everything in green is, is real data based off of my bows shot at chronograph point blank chronograph at different distances. And then I just fill in the data. Uh, oh, the other, okay. the other speeds that I have highlighted in yellow are just extrapolations based off of assumptions on drag. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're going to be close. They might not be exact. You know, you guys have set up with the lab radar and the, the, uh, arrow gun would be awesome for filling in the gaps. Yeah. So uh, are, real quick, are these, are these field points or are these broadheads that you're, uh, measuring here? Are these, uh, 
Did it's you shoot the shoot rockets through the through the radar or through your chronograph? Yeah, I've, I've shot them, and it, even at forty yards, I've not measured a difference, a, a, a significant difference. So it's within the noise of what the chronograph is reading at forty. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because we're seeing some interesting stuff shooting the arrow gun, and the new arrow gun that we just got from FX, the air driven one. Um, we're seeing some interesting drag data just come from the broadheads themselves. Oh, just from the field points themselves. Yeah, actually, a different field, different field points too. It's it's pretty crazy. Yeah, uh, and honestly, you really won't see that difference uh, affect itself at the target with uh, at forty yards. When you start getting out to sixty, is really where the where the differences would be. So I'm not surprised you don't see that difference here. Um, and it also depends on what broadhead you're using. So right. Um, do you know? Uh, do you know though what what broadhead you're using on these particular shots? Is it the same for for all of these, or it's a, a uh, different one? No, it was well, I guess a range. Uh, but like for instance, this green trad 175 setup, I was using um, day six broadheads out of that setup, the solid, so they were, you know, quiet, non vented heads. Uh, out of the okay. the compound setup at 308, uh, which is the the rig I was running this year, that was with a Sever 1.5. Um, and like I said, out to 40, I haven't measured much of a difference shooting non-mented broadheads at that distance in terms of the velocity decay, or, or okay. I guess the sound for that matter. Uh, vented broadheads, different story. But yeah, so the, uh, I guess, interesting things from my perspective, when I look at this 175 foot per second range and you look at the yardage, which I have to scroll back to the left side of the screen to see that again, uh, the yardage at which they would start to move six yards. So like if you're, you know, 15 feet up in a tree, that basically means like almost any deer you take a shot at with that system, they have the ability to start moving if they want to, if they react to that bow and decide to, to get out of dodge at, at almost any shot distance you're going to take. And it's just a matter of how far are they going to move? Now, the deer I shot at with my recurve this year was 18 and a half yards. And you look at where that extrapolates down the list here and you see it's like right at the bottom of the yellow which is almost exactly when you watch the footage frame by frame, almost exactly at the bottom of that deer string jump is when the arrow finally, you know, got to that location. Um, and then when I plug in the same exact time of flight for my compound, had I taken the same shot at the same deer with the same exact point of impact, the arrow would have hit prior to the deer's spine dropping below that point of impact. It would have been a dead deer. Um, and then everything else in the middle is kind of, you know, between these two extremes where, you know, if I look at this 308 feet per second setup, I look at where the yellow starts and it's at about 18 yards. If I look at a 250 foot per second setup, it happens at 16 yards and it doesn't seem like much, but when you're talking about exactly that close range scenario and, you know, I got a quartering two shot, I know I can place it right here, but what's going to happen by the time that arrow gets there. And I, I think I've heard you talk about this too, Troy, with just how close you set up your, your stands to the feeders, you know, you get them close and you're just taking out a lot of that variability. Yeah. When I would do, when I pulled my feeders in for, I used to have them about, about 22 and I pulled them into 17 and stuff started dying. I mean, I'm talking about, a, it was a dramatic difference, totally anecdotal. I just said, I know we're not hitting them good and I can get them closer. And, but remember, I also have an interesting sample size with outlaws, in-laws, uncles, cousins, and <laughs> all my nieces and nephews who don't even realize they're shooting some of the best arrows and broadhead systems on the earth. Uncle Troy just has everything, right? So they shoot whatever the hell I give them. And I'm telling you, 16 yards, 15 is all of a sudden, it starts getting, we're not tracking, you know what I mean? Even yeah. no blood trail, because one's fat or whatever and corked up, they still go 60. They just, they're just not far enough away to matter. Right, right. And were, when they were at two, I had a couple of feeders at 25. It was an absolute, you just didn't know what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. I had to have people start videoing with their phones so I could see what happened. Yeah. And then I, a couple of them, you just go, that was not going to die. I'm fine. Pick your arrow up, you know? And, and what would be interesting and would either prove or disprove some of this hypothesis and, and these numbers, at least maybe even regionally between my deer and the deer you got down there, or the hogs. Uh -huh. see if they react differently would be either shooting at them with uh, either the arrow gun at 25 yards or like a crossbow because if you get the speeds up high enough if you know this 
theory is, you know, proving true, then you'd get to a speed where it, you'd start to see the same lethality potentially at 25 as you did when you moved your feeders closer with the, you yeah, know, on, a, on average slower bows. Absolutely. Because I've spoken on a lot of podcasts about this topic in the last year. And I said, I, my anecdotal analysis, once again, is we don't realize how quiet the ecosystem is to a deer. We have so much noise around us constantly, phones ringing and people calling and pingers going off on your stupid notifications, car noise, kids, whatever. We're used to like this level of noise. But when you sit out in the woods, your ears ring. There's no sound. And I think it sounds like a helicopter coming at them. I think the difference between the ecosystem, they naturally live, they make noise, they get eaten. You don't, you don't see deer running around grunting and squealing and yapping all the time. Even the doe bleats are super low. Grunts aren't real loud, right? You got to be close to them. You don't hear it. It's not like a bull elk going, you know? <laughs> but I'm, I'm pretty well convinced like if we could speak deer, this would be a whole lot easier. That is so quiet. And then all of a sudden there's this pop and a helicopter. And I don't know that there's an aero platform to shoot through 14.7 PSI. That's atmospheric pressure for y'all that are listening. <laughs> um, pushing the molecules out of the way is, is quiet. I don't, it's quiet. Unfortunately, we don't have the situation where we can shoot the same deer with two different arrows. Yeah, that would. All <laughs> right. right. Catch and, and release. Right. Catch and <laughs> let him go and then shoot him again with the, in the, uh, with a fast arrow and a slow arrow arrow so we'll never be able to compare the, compare the same deer we'll never get the great data set that we actually need to be able to address shoot a deer part. 10 times and have him come back right yeah have him come back and, and say the same scenario right and and then we would find out but but now it's it's a, a different deer on a different day maybe a different state wind and uh maybe he has fast twitch muscles instead of slow twitch muscles or maybe just wasn't feeling it that day and, right. uh, and so he didn't move very fast. Or they're ruddy. When well, they're, they're ruddy, ruddy, when they're ruddy, you just shoot them. I mean, they, yeah, they behave. One observation I've had is that it seems like a tendency that early season, they're less likely to drop than later into the season. That yeah. it, it, it seems like, especially if it's windy, right? You got a big tree canopy. There's, we say it's quiet, right? But early season, it's a lot louder ambient. Yeah, right. With, I'll give wind points for wind, but generally speaking, it's there's not a lot of screaming and running around. There's no fire yeah. trucks yeah. compared to us, right? And and maybe you know they haven't been harassed that much early in the season. You, know, you got the bugs and you know, like if there is wind and, and uh, foliage mm -hmm. moving around, and it seems like when you got the tree canopy gone, and especially if you got that quiet day, maybe you got snow on the ground. It's like man, they can really. Like the slightest, I don't know that you can shoot a bow and arrow combination quiet enough in those settings where they're just going to stand there and take it unless there's some kind of behavioral aspect that's overriding, which probably is, is true as well. Yeah, the, the rut the being the most prominent. When I watch videos of rut deer, when you see the deer rutting, the bucks just take it. I mean, because they're just, they're out of their mind, right? I mean, they're just not normal. And they're, they're distracted. The, the doe that Sam had shot in Nebraska a couple of years ago was walking sam did the mouth bleat to stop the deer the deer stops right out in the open looks up at our direction and you're thinking this deer is probably going to jump the string because you know we just alerted it to our position to get it to stop mm -hmm. for a shot she shot and the deer did not flinch and arrow zip right through and you take the opposite scenario where i shot at that uh, again a doe this time totally relaxed just browsing her way through the woods with my recurve, which is also a really quiet setup, uh, you know, still got foliage on the trees, did not try to alert the deer to my presence at all, just waited until it naturally gave me a good shot opportunity, and it totally flipped out. Wow. So it was like just that that inerrant variability and I guess not only the biology, but also just the behavioral aspect of it is really hard to predict at those intermediate ranges where you could have, you know, toward the end of that yellow in the graph. Right. It's, it's, a, it will, it, I don't, I'm convinced when we're, ne this is the puzzle we'll never figure out. We can sit around and talk about KE momentum and changing broadheads and sharp and all the stuff and the Darrow systems and all that. I don't think we'll ever beat them. That's why I've, I've been holding that data, that those videos for a year and a half before I posted that. It was just like, I sat around thinking, am I right about this? And then a guy, I got two this year where guys were shooting 10 yards and the deer 
I'm talking came out of the, they went like matrix on him. One guy was shooting, you know, 525 grains out of an 80 pound compound at 10 yards and the deer ducked like crazy. 10 yards. It's unbelievable. Hmm. And then five of the, or three of the shots I showed, they, they just, you know, bonk. thank you. Yeah. you know, done. So. And, and I guess what I'd be interested to see is on the, the 10 yard shot, do we know it, can you go frame by frame? Is it 30 frames per second, 60% or 60 frames a second? How certain can we be to the exact distance? Because if, if it was truly 10 yards, then perhaps that's some of that regional variability where maybe those deer are able to move faster based on the, yeah. the deer that I've looked at and the footage I've looked at. If you said 10 yards, you know, let's say that guy's shooting 270 or 280, you yeah, would right. look at the data and say, there's no way they can physiologically hear the sound and then also react to the point where they can, you know, get a, out of the way to make it a miss. Mm -hmm. Um, but I can't extrapolate that beyond my own data set. Yeah. So, um, I, it's really interesting that we're having this conversation tonight, uh, because I started thinking about this just last week. And, and the reason I did was I was watching, uh, one of the crossbow channels, death by Bungie. Uh, and that guy was, was hunting and he, he, he was hunting at it with, uh, a crossbow that was firing about 400 feet per second. And a doe jumped out of the woods at 42 yards and he had cameras set up, nice cameras, probably 60 frames per second or so. And he did the analysis on it. When did that, and he missed the deer. And he's like, okay. Oh, she jumped out of the way? She ducked and got mm -hmm. out of the way. She okay. jumped the string, got yeah. out of the way completely. And, and so his conclusion was he, he, he played back the video and he actually could put a dot on where the, where the aim point was and then a dot where the arrow actually hit. Or, or I'm sorry, where, uh, how far the, the uh, animal had, had uh, ducked under the, under the string, jumped the string. So his conclusion was that uh, with the 400 feet per second crossbow, the deer was 42 yards and the deer started to move when the arrow was at 32 yards. Okay. So, so his conclusion was don't shoot past 32 yards. And I'm like, well, what if the deer was at 32 yards and you shot and it jumped the string and it jumped the string when the arrow was 10 yards in front of it yeah, then? At 22, like you said. Yeah, yeah. you said you kind of see this same distance no matter the distance of the shot. Yeah. Right? Did you say that? Yeah. I may and, have heard you wrong. And what'll be interesting here, and uh, just as a, a quick FYI, uh, we got two minutes left. So if we need to, we can... Once this one ends, we can restart another one. All right, we're back. So what I did quick while we were between Zoom calls, I'll share my screen again. Uh, I put together an example at 400 feet a second uh, for that last example. And again, it's just, we're looking at the, the time that it takes for sound to travel. I think I assumed 50 degrees Fahrenheit. We got the yardage in there. Uh, we have the, the time of flight, which is, you know, basically just the the time it took to travel that particular yard at that speed plus whatever time had elapsed each yard along the way and then the reaction time is just the time of flight minus the speed of sound uh so okay. at 400 feet a second i'll just go through and get it up to about that you know 0.8 or so so that gets us to about right there and then the green range is somewhere about in uh in that range so like what 17, 18 to like 24, 25. And then our yellow zone would be somewhere around in this neighborhood. And then orange would be out at like 50. So one thing that my extrapolation is probably not doing a great job at is knowing what the actual drag looks like. This is based off of the drag of a 308 foot per second setup, not a 400 foot per second crossbow. So mm -hmm. if the drag is much more significant there, that'll truncate this information. Um, yeah. But what I'm seeing is that, you know, that, that uh, video that you guys watched, the results are probably not terribly far off from just this real rough estimate. Yeah. Okay. That, you know, upper 20s versus, you know, like 50 or so. Um, and it sounds like the drag, based on his experience, would probably make it even, you know, more truncated. But to his, to his point too, I guess, or I guess the, I guess, output of that video it sounded like he was saying at least based on his setup 
if you were to take a shot at 25 yards or even 20 yards, he's not anticipating having to worry about string jump. That's what he was saying. Yeah. Out to 32 yards. He was, that was his conclusion. And, uh, and I thought about that for a while and I was like, well, I don't know if that's the right conclusion. And the reason I, I've been thinking about this is because of my uh, experience in the mil in working in the government. Um, at the time uh, I was working doing uh, protection, basically we were trying to beat the protection that the, the threat armor had on it, right? But the Israelis who live in the environment <laughs> of uh, being shot at a lot came up with an active protection system called uh, Iron Fist. And basically, they had sensors mounted on their vehicles that if any projectile, regardless of the speed, whether it's a mortar or a uh, high velocity kinetic energy round was coming in, when it detected at a certain distance, maybe 30 feet from the, from the vehicle, it would actually uh, sense that, that uh, threat coming in, and then it would fire a projectile out to that and destroy it or explode, uh, put some high explosives out there in the general vicinity of the era of the uh, projectile and, and move it off course, okay? So this idea of an act of protection system, I think may transfer over to animals. If we, if we put our minds, not at, the, not at the bow, but at the animal, we think about, hey, these animals not only have a reactive armor around them, which is the bone structure and the, and the way that they move, uh, the bones and everything move, um, but they have an active protection system around them that their sensors are their eyes, their ears, and their nose. Their uh, computer is their brain, and it's acting based on uh, both instinct and, uh, and experience, right? And, and so I started thinking about that, and I was thinking, okay, in this case, does that mean that they have a, a, a zone of active protection around them that's a certain distance out and deer that are in the woods all the time have a zone of, of uh, an active protection zone that's even further out than a, a deer that might have an active protection zone that is uh, in Kansas. Because that deer may see people on a tractor all the time or may see cars from a mile away. And, you know, I'm not gonna worry about those. But the, but the deer that's in the woods has to worry about everything. He can't see all around him. And so he's gonna be a much more jumpy uh, type of deer, or maybe, you know, I was talking about maybe they're older, or, you know, they don't have fast twitch muscles anymore, or something like that. But so if that's, if that kind of scenario is true, the, the idea that Rich came up with, uh, with his crossbow test is, I don't think correct. Uh, because had that had that deer had come out at 32 yards, his supposition is that he would hit the deer, because it didn't have time to move. But my supposition is, since the deer has an active protection zone all the way around him, and it changes, it might be cordial shape, heart shape rather than round, but uh, or hemispherical, um, and it may change if the deer's looking away versus if the deer's looking towards you. That even if the deer came out at 32 yards, he still would have would have jumped the string, because all he did was subtract the distance off and from his from his data set and say, okay, if the deer were within this range. And I think the deer are smarter than that. I think the deer can say, hey, my eyes might have seen something, my ears might have heard something, my brain might have told me about something else that happened. And all of that goes together to say, I got to jump, I got to move, uh, I got to duck, right? Something's coming towards me. And I think that fits in with the idea that if you shoot a bow 90 degrees to, to an animal and it doesn't move, and you shoot a bow with an arrow coming towards you, I think whether it's sight or sound or, or maybe he's alert because he smelled you, maybe, you know, things just, he was just uncomfortable because his experience is telling that. I think if we start putting our, our mindset in the mind of the deer rather than the mind of the, our, our, our situation in the mind of the traveling with the arrow, that uh, we might come up with a better hypothesis for deer in different regions moving at, at, uh, at different response times or different distances away from the arrow. Now, if what I'm saying is true, that means the arrow speed doesn't matter. The zone of influence is, or the, the zone of protection around the deer is, is the thing that matters. Now, we might not be able to determine that, 
you might not be able to determine that, you know, Eastern deer have a different zone of protection than uh, Western deer do. Um, but I think it's, a, it's at least a theory that warrants investigation. I think your data set and others, including Rich's, might be uh, a good start to looking in that direction uh, to see if we can find something out. Unfortunately, like I said, we can't shoot the two different arrows, a fast one and a slow one at the same deer given the same scenario to see if that's actually true or not. But so we have to answer that question uh, statistically. If the, if, the, if the protection zones the same, same size all the time, imagine a 10 foot hula hoop around or something, just for, your, just for my dumb head, right? Then theoretically the faster arrow would get there. Well, it, it, it might get there. By half a millisecond. Maybe it can't jump out of the way. Maybe as soon as it enters that zone, it's got to react, right? So there's some place where the air, the deer's, you're inside the zone of protection, right, of the deer. Mm -hmm. But I think that that zone of protection shape will change. It might be closer to the deer if the deer is looking away. It might be closer to the deer if the de uh, deer is, is not startled in any way. Mm -hmm. It's perfectly relaxed, but it might be completely, it might be much smaller if they're in the rut. Right, because you know, even the doe are looking around trying to figure out what that that buck is up to. Um, so we don't know. We 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 don't know. And and I I think if if what I'm saying is true, that zone of protection doesn't. If it's just like iron fist, right, active protection system, we're mimicking animals' response in the first place. It's not it's not real new science. It's just we're trying to do what nature's been doing for thousands of years just to, to clarify with that zone of protection in in the military sense it could detect something beyond the that zone but it wouldn't necessarily fire a, a counter projectile until it breached the zone of protection yeah that's right so they they'll have it turned on when they go into a war zone again that's called iron fist it's an israeli uh system to protect uh, tanks and armored vehicles but uh once the projectile enters into a particular zone, or maybe it's 30 feet away, I forget what the number is, and, and if I knew, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. Um, but, the, uh, but once it enters that zone, regardless if it's a mortar that's moving slow or a kinetic energy projectile that's moving fast, it reacts to that. And if that's true, the speed of the arrow doesn't really come into play. It's, it's because it's a distance thing now. It doesn't come into play if that zone is big enough. And so in Rich's case, that zone was 10 yards, okay? And for uh, a Western deer, that zone might be 20 yards, 30 yards, because the deer is accustomed to having, you know, seeing things, a lot, a, of, space around a lot of space around it, so a much bigger zone. But in the woods, uh, like in East Texas or Arkansas or someplace like that, that zone might be five yards. And, uh, and so, you know, uh, so you would have a better chance of hitting them. At, hitting them. I'm sorry. Still. That zone might be bigger, not smaller. Sorry, it might so be Western bigger. So Western deer might be more relaxed, which is what we see. Which on is the, a smaller zone. You see about mule deer, but mule deer, stupid yeah. anyway. It's kind of a in, <laughs> kind of an inverse relationship. So the zone is small for deer that are usually out in the open, but mm -hmm. the zone is much bigger because the deer can't see very far away in the woods, and it's got to have all his sensors on all the time. And it's like, man, if I hear something 30 feet away, I'm going to jump. Right. I don't remember seeing this. Was something that just popped into my head when I was yammering. I don't. Re I don't remember seeing many videos of mule deer jumping. I don't they think seem... it's as, as common. I've only shot one of them, but mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like they're in general as jumpy as whitetails are, from what I've yeah. gathered. Same thing yeah, with elk, so, right? And they're also so bigger, more massive. Elk will kind of just take it like a champ. At the same most of the time, yeah. At the same time, I, I saw. Uh, uh, Death by Bungie's video. I also watched Chris B's video, and when he was shooting his deer, that deer hardly—I mean, it was basically looking right at the arrow, and and he didn't move at all. And but he was in a situation where it was a wide open area, so his zone of protection might have been uh, real small. Right? Small or big? I got to think about this. Yeah. yeah, it's real small. It might be real small. Three four yards or something, because that deer is used to seeing guys on tractors. He's used to seeing all kinds of, of uh, things going on around him that just don't affect him. And so his environment has, has changed his, his uh, idea of what, what protection means. And then the pigs have an interesting wrinkle to them. They never stop moving. 
Well, okay, so let's talk about those pigs. You know, we're talking about that that kind of herd mentality. If there is a zone of protection around these, one. Uh, around one, what and if they all cloud. overlap? There's, there's a cloud. cloud all around the ones. And so I know the last time I shot a, a pig under a feeder, I mean, every one, every one of the pigs just, they took off, except for one that was a little bit outside of that area and he's like he like he looks up and says oh straight shot to the feeder and here he, <laughs> here he came he didn't move he didn't run away he didn't do anything and i think he might have been outside outside of this sort of bubble uh, uh as opposed to all of those other ones having overlapping bubbles and they're able to move because the one next to him moved because he heard he heard the hit of the of the first uh, uh first one i shot so they don't jump when they chase each other, though. So I've so, noticed that. Like, what do you mean? Exactly. So you'll get a, a bunch of shots in or whatever, and I, I've stopped shooting little ones pretty much. And then a boar will come in and just start pushing stuff around. Like he's trying to run everything off so they'll go away. So he'll push over here, and these guys will come in behind him. <laughs> and he'll come over here, and the other one's coming behind him. But they don't jump the string from him. Hmm. Like the whole herd, when, when he chases some stuff, they're like, great, he's chasing those two. And they they still stay there, but they don't all, they don't all scatter back. He ends up chasing one around. Yeah. And I've seen them chase them all around the feeders and the other ones are like, yeah, oh, man, like I get they're eat. not here bothering us. Yeah. So that's the, the two things from the pigs has been seeing them all jump when I shoot at them, which you verified on deer too. Yeah. And, and if we watched more video, we'd see that if you watch the other, usually you don't watch the other deer. You just watch them when they shoot, right? Your head just kind of trains on that. I'm going to start watching that. See if there's other deer around. See what they do. Yeah. So I guess to finish that up, Garrett, what the thought is: How can we determine if this if this zone of protection around a deer exists, and how can we tell? Uh, how can we determine if it's the speed of the arrow makes a difference on whether or not that uh, deer is going to react in time or not? Uh, I don't know that. I, I have to think about that. I think you'd have to, you'd have to do it on long enough shots to where you, you'd know for sure they're either reacting to the sound of the projectile or the bow, because like all the short range stuff, it's really muddy. Like they could be reacting to either and they yeah. have the same result. It's real muddy. But if yeah. you take a shot at 60, 70, if they're reacting to the bow, they're going to be long gone out of almost any speed bow. But if they're well, reacting to that sound of Levi shooting at, I think it looks like an all dad or something like 103. Yeah. And it's out there and the arrow's coming. And then the thing, it literally just as the arrow's approaching, takes a step forward. He shot it right in the middle. It was on target. Yeah. And, and so that, that makes it seem like, just like you were saying earlier, like the arrow finally got to a point where that noise got startling enough, loud enough to where it's, okay, I need to react. Right. And, and maybe to right. like Levi's point, he would have had maybe the same exact result at 40. That he would right. have hit a hundred. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's my point too. Uh, that's what we don't know because we can't shoot the same animal twice. I think you could, based on if you had the the footage, and you just went frame by frame, you had high enough resolution, you could be able to do the math and figure out exactly how far away the projectile was when the animal started moving, and then mm -hmm. you could just you know reverse back the, you know, eight hundredths of a second for the the time where uh, it took for the brain to make the decision we need to move. Right. So I think you could, you could figure that out as long as the shots were long enough to get rid of that muddiness of projectile versus launcher. Yeah. That's really interesting. Uh, we need to do that. I think, I think I need to do that. We all who scientists, engineers, whoever uh, can do it ought to do that. Um, one, I think to uh, sort of uh, help people who've adopted you know, heavier arrow setups to give them some confidence in their shots and, and the other guys who are shooting super fast to make them realize, well, maybe that's not the entire answer to, uh, to archery. One uh, thing you brought up is possibly the sound of the shaft flexing. Interesting, yeah. We talked that's about that on the hill one day. What if the shaft is going wah, 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 wah? Because the shaft's not stable. The shaft's not straight. The shaft's going like this. It's buckling all the way down between the point and the and the knock. It is not perfect. It is not a completely straight stick. And he said one day, I wonder if there's if it makes noise. Hmm. Just we were just talking out there, jacking around. I was like, what but if they can a, pick up stuff we can't pick up? On like a bear a dog shaft, whistle. You can hear a bear shaft coming at you. 
or you put a camera mm-hmm. out and you shoot a bear shaft, it sounds different than an arrow that has veins on it. it seems like usually wow. the arrow, you shoot an arrow with veins on it, you hear the thump of the bow, and then you hear that increasingly loud hiss. But if you shoot a bear shaft, it's got a little mm-hmm. bit different like tone to it. It's still a noise. It's a lot quieter I've, than veins, but I've done that. I've stood behind a tree and had people shoot a bear shaft by me, and they're pretty. They're not quiet. Yeah, I did that. I, I was hiding by the side of a tree when we were shooting those sixty-yard shots. Mm-hmm. I remember that. Yeah, that's right. What, you could hear them. You could definitely. Hear them. One more thought on that: uh, the, the zone of protection idea. The the data that I showed would make the assumption that them reacting to the sound of the bow is worst case scenario. And zone of protection would only help you, right? Because if they react to the sound of the bow, that's going to be always worst case. They're going to react as fast as they possibly could. They're not going to wait at all. Um, and a shot taken in the green zone would be equivalent to you having breached the zone of protection at the moment you take the shot, right? So you're getting close enough to where it doesn't matter. You're already inside the zone, right? But if you stretch it out to 40, 50, then you could imagine that whole table and all the colors kind of moving down right yeah yeah that puts your zone that means the the hula hoops 15 yards and it's a 30 yard yeah hula hoop all around yeah diameter right right so 30 yeah. yard diameter hula hoop yeah. theoretically and if you could get inside the hula hoop then you're good yeah, yeah that's right so, and, and, that and that's where hoop. speed would help you if, if, if the hula hoop was a fixed 30 yards let's say and yeah. you have 400 feet a second versus 150 feet a second if the animal reacts, you know, your worst case scenario instantly, as soon as the arrow's coming at them, as soon as that sound hits their ear, they're starting to move. Just by the, the difference in time of flight, one arrow is going to get there way faster than the other. And that's, I think, where some of the, the minutia comes in, right? And then all that yellow stuff is, is the stuff we can't count on. Yeah. yeah so that's interesting. But the distance that, 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 uh, that time has is very short. If, if there is a zone of protection, let's say it's, it's 10 yards away, 30 feet, um, it, whether it's a fast arrow or, or a slow arrow, um, you know, you, the deer can't react for, for those, maybe, maybe can't react more for the fast arrow, but it's not a 60 yard shot anymore because the deer right. didn't react when the, when, when the arrow left the bow, the deer, the, the arrow, the deer only reacted when the arrow was close to him within his, his, uh, zone of protection, I guess. Right. Use right. That word. So, I, so I would, I would, I would speculate that bow sound matters more really close range, long range arrow noise probably matters more. And then there's a gray area in the middle. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I really do think the, the arrows are so yeah. much louder to them than they are to us. Yeah. And I, I know for a fact by looking at a thousand shots on pigs, it's more than halfway there before they jump. I don't know how close it is. And most of my shots are under 20. But I just keep them tight because I'm studying things. I want to hit them okay, right? Mm-hmm. Like I'm doing a broad hit test or whatever. But it's, not ha- it's, it's less than halfway there. And if it's 20 yards, it's somewhere between 15 and 16 yards out there before they start moving and then who knows what's going to happen because the pigs are stupid because they're annoying because they're so short they spin more than they roll and then they drop they can't drop when you have their legs are that long. i mean their legs are a you know a big one their legs are 10 inches long it's not a deer right so they tend to they tend to either roll let's see if i get this going roll that straight roll away or the worst is this because then it hits high and you know yeah. It's tough. Turn a broadside into a just graze them type of a shot. Sometimes they really help you actually on a, on a quarter and away shot. If they'll spin, spin away, it actually ends up hitting them. The broadhead goes right here and it's lights out. I mean, you, they, the minute it hits them, their butt's going sideways. They're done. So they help you a lot. I've talked about this a lot. Um, a lot of people say quarter and away shots are favorable on a feral hog. Um, actually, from a bone structure standpoint, no, because you're lining up a picket fence. And their ribs are super durable. They're two times a deer. So you've actually lined up, you know, you've taken uh, bones that look like this. Let's see if I can get my hand clear here. And then you, you're starting to shoot down the, you know, down the bones. But they often spin away and it ends up hitting them back here. And then the broadhead literally hits them in the, a lot of time in the spine and rolls them over. And they actually help you in that manner. Especially if you hit them a little high. You'll torch them. So... 
it's just super interesting um, topic to talk about because we'll, we'll never be able to, I've got to get catching with these deer, Barnett. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get a magic revival pill. We'll stick them with a needle and well, come back. Maybe we just tie up the deer and we miss him every time. Right? <laughs> you just get close to it, right? I can miss him. <laughs> hey, Garrett, if we're shooting a 6'5 Creedmoor, we only have to get within this far of him. It'll kill him every time. <laughs> you don't even have to hit him. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's funny. We'll start that up right now. Yeah. So interesting topic. I was super fun when I was talking to you about this on text and got on the phone with you and saw your spreadsheet. It's and the fact that they're all your deer is fun. I mean, you get to look at your own data. Mm -hmm. It's a similar thing. I encourage people all the time with the blood trail videos that I put up, which is completely unpredictable. People say, nah, I usually get a blood trail. I said, write them down. Start writing them down. Everyone will know. And you'll see that they're wide and varied. Some of them don't bleed and they go 35 yards. You know, and then the other one's a gusher and then one you'll hit kind of okay. And you know, it's, it's, it's just like that. It, one thing I've learned from this cat, put the stuff down. Right. And, yeah. the, tru and the truth pops out. Yeah. It just hits you in the head. Or you're a dumbass like we did the other day. We've had... What did we do? <laughs> we, did we do Gary, so we were shooting the arrow gun. Okay. And don't do this if you have a lab radar. So we set the, we set, we set the table up at like 32, I think. And we set, the, we set the lab radar for 10, 20, and 30. We shot like 20 times and we got some crazy data because it was too close to the target. And sometimes the lab radar was picking up the impact and the target and the arrow was slowing down. Remember they were yeah. wide and very, yeah. you know, put it way out there, but just dumb stuff like that, that back to them, making a point about data. Once we got the data type, then you can actually do something with it. And he's been putting drag equations on the stuff and we're doing some broadhead testing, just flying them and seeing them what the drag is again back to the point whatever you're trying to study here if you really care don't be anecdotal about it like literally get out a spreadsheet like you did you put all your deer down sam's deer all that stuff and you look at it and you go huh what does that show me it's super fun because you know something you're not just guessing on a message board you know mm -hmm. and things start to become more clear Unfortunately, with this data set, and I think if we put a thousand of them on there, I think the answer is we don't know. I mean, we don't know what they're going to do. We just don't know. I mean, I had that one shot on there. I don't know who it was. One of the TV shows. It's a mowed field. Deer's out there. Deer's just feeding along. It doesn't look alert at all and completely whiffed it. In that particular show, they shoot fast and they shoot max and all that stuff with the deer but the deer looks completely tails just you know yep. you didn't look alert at all and i've had that happen a lot i've had deer that i said oh this deer's dead bounce it off the top of them or something it's crazy and then the next one it takes it like a champ yeah so well, grant woods popularized that that uh observation too about whether you shoot with your head up or head down and I i'm definitely starting to pay more attention to that too that deer I shot at with my recurve this year had its head down. It was totally relaxed, just like the example you brought up, but this was really mm -hmm. slow arrow, you know, small, quiet, uh, fletching, non-vented broadhead, like as close to a quiet, as quiet of a setup as you can put up deer, totally relaxed, mm -hmm. walking through hardwoods, just kind of browsing as it went and, you know, totally jumped out of its skin, just like the, you know, example of the open mown grass field, you know, shooting the high speed stuff. So just to your point, like right. I've, I've, I've talked to Grant about that and on the phone and he, a lot of people I haven't had, I've had people send it back to me that Grant did that on the video I just put up and he believes, and it's pretty valid. He thinks it's like a seesaw. So they are levering, their head turns into a lever and allows yeah. them to move down faster. Like they're picking it up as they're coiling down. And that head offsets it just like a teeter totter. And I think he's probably right. I think he's probably right because it's just one more. It's a it's counterbalance. Yeah, it's a pretty classic counterbalance because it's a total muscular reaction. For everybody listening, if you've made it this far, <laughs> <laughs> right. it's not gravity. Thanks. This is not gravity. 
We are not talking about something that drops at the speed of gravity. If it was gravity, then we would have a fixed point to aim at every time and we could guess it. This is a muscular reaction, spin, roll, drop and spin and roll is the worst scenario possible, except from a tree stand, because then they lay it up for you and whack it. But um, it's not gravity. So there's been a few videos of people saying, hey, we got the scientist, he's super smart, blah, 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 we're gonna drop this sandbag and we're gonna make a chart. There's no freaking way that's accurate because the animals are moving them, physically moving their bodies. Yeah. And, I mean, it might be close if they start with their head up and the end with their head up, right? But if their head starts down, yeah. then they're changing their center of mass relative to their their physical body that's position. Correct. Just like the guys yeah. going over the bar backwards in the Olympics doing the high jump. Their center of mass is going underneath the bar when their body's going over the top because they're throwing their head backwards, yeah, right. tucking their legs that's in. Right. That's a yeah. really great uh, that example. That is a great example. Right. They're just flexing backwards. And the deer are doing the same thing. They're doing the high jump up down, right? And um, I, I think Grant's probably got it right and one interesting thing that just popped in my head too you don't see a lot of mule deer shoot, being shot at feeding what do you mean by that generally they're just kind of moseying through the path through the thing they are just kind of they seem to have their head up a lot i'm gonna start watching that more but i don't you don't see classically in whitetail deer hunting the deer's heads are down or they're browsing on something and you're whacking that hmm. mule deer hunting seems to be more the deer up moving around I mean, there's some bedded shots and that kind of thing. Bedded shots are probably great for us because they can't really move very well. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm going to have to start looking at it. Definitely elk. You don't see many shots with elk with their head down ever. Garrett, what was your, uh, I don't know if we talked about this or not. Did you have a conclusion based on the data set? You're probably the one that's most familiar with your data set. You, you created it and put it all together. What, what is your uh, synopsis so far? of your set so i guess what my conclusions were just looking at the context of my setup and my wife's setup and when i say my setup meaning compound and traditional i know that i have to treat those differently and i know that when i'm shooting slow with traditional or like my wife shooting slow right now there's a lot less flexibility even at 20 yards 20 yards is like almost at the orange shooting at those speeds so that means like my wife taking a 20 yard shot has to be very careful about which opportunity she takes and doesn't take at that range, even if she's a really you know great archer at that range and has to start paying attention opportunity, to things like you're gonna try to avoid certain shot angles. Certain shot angles and just you know mm-hmm. paying attention if that head is up or down, uh, making sure that you're aiming for let's say the heart instead of mid lung at that shot distance, mm-hmm. just to kind of give you hopefully some extra forgiveness there if the deer does decide to jump the string you might still get that lethal shot or maybe spine it and you hit the heart if it doesn't move uh, and same thing with traditional i've been talking to a lot of traditional guys trying to understand more about the you know the different possibilities there and what different guys aim at um what type of shots they take or don't take because same thing there um if i really want to make it to where the deer's not going to be able to react much i don't have much op- options other than shooting them under 10 yards which uh, there's, you know, not that many opportunities versus my compound, you know, by the numbers, I have a, a fairly long draw length and I shoot fairly heavy poundage. So my momentum numbers and my KE numbers are over two X what either my traditional bow setup is or my wife setup. Mm-hmm. And so I can get away with shooting a little bit lighter, faster arrow relative to that draw length and still have way more penetration potential, all things, you know, being equal. And so I can take advantage of a little bit more of that speed and get that, that green zone pushed out, you know, 14, 16, 17 yards and be able to take some more, I guess, non-typical or non-standard shot angles like that one I, I had in North Dakota. Yeah, that great video. big deer you shot quartering in, yep. Yep, same thing there. And his head was up too, and he started to react, but position, body position he was in, he just physically couldn't move that much. Versus yeah. if, if he would have been, you know, feeding in a field or something with his head down, might have been a totally different uh, that was scenario. A big, physically big animal too. I mean, he was a big buck too. Is but is that him back there? Yeah, yeah, back back there. But that physically, that's a huge deer. That's you know twice the biggest stuff I shoot. Down here we have Jimmy Buffett deer. They're super skinny and they like summertime, <laughs> and they don't. They're just not big. But yeah, that was really that was a totally reasonable shot for yeah. the situation. So, so my conclusion was with my compound, I can shoot a little bit 
faster arrow because of the nature of my you know draw and the poundage that I shoot and be able to get some of the advantages of a faster setup like expanding that that green zone out a little bit further uh, mm -hmm. making sure that they can't jump the string that that well in in close opportunities making sure that uh, my pin gaps are a little bit closer so there's advantages there from just being able to make sure like oh yeah I'm going to clear that limb um, right. or just if I'm off on my range estimation my wife you know if she guesses it's 15 and it's actually 23 that's a big point of impact difference she's not going to always have the time to bring a rangefinder out with me it's like well my 20 and 30 yard pins are like this yeah. so right. there, there's some advantages i'm able to get shooting that faster setup with the compound that i'm never going to be able to replicate or even too. or even yeah or even try to replicate out of like my recurve setup for instance because i'm never going to be right. able to shoot even close to fast enough right that i've told people all along and when i was going nail guy hunting last year i said i'm not shooting over 40 i'm just not that's not that's not what i do I just, I'm not good at it, but I like the fact that you're thinking about under 20. The hunting public guys have said for years, we like 25 and under. Yeah. And before we started talking about this kind of stuff with them, we're talking about arrow setups and all that stuff. They just kind of figured it out by shooting at a lot of deer and going 30s gets special. <laughs> that was their basic analysis, right? It's just mm -hmm. tougher to hit them right. And yeah, uh, I mean, you, you get out to that, you get out of that zone where it's like yeah, 25 to 35. Yeah, that, that's getting... about that point. You shoot slow, you shoot fast. You're like, there's just so many more variables, even oh, if you are shooting a fast small. setup. Mm -hmm. But then I maybe, maybe to that. the, you know, point about the, you know, zone of protection, maybe that mid range truly is worst case. And maybe it becomes more predictable again at further ranges, pres presuming yeah. a guy is accurate enough to, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I'm t I tend to think that too. And uh, I mean, we'll see, we'll, we'll be watching the data sets and the videos uh, uh, really more carefully now because we're looking for something uh, uh, rather than was it good shot placement? Let, let's look at the reaction times and see. And uh, maybe we can put a theory together that actually holds water. I would love to be able to do that. Did you think uh, deer didn't jump the string on you much before you started videoing? Mm, it's it's always been a mix sometimes they did sometimes they didn't i don't know that i would say there was a much of a difference i, I was I know, amazed at how much they the pigs moved once i started videoing it was started to it started to put all these nightmare scenarios in my head and i started realizing and, holy and, smokes and what you don't mean is they saw you videoing them and they're like we're gonna get out of here what <laughs> right. you mean is that you noticed something that you didn't see because you could slow the video down right. and start seeing their reaction. We used to have all this trouble finding them and people say, oh, they're just tough. They're hard to kill, all this stuff. Then I start videoing them and realizing you're missing my six inches. Almost every time. Not you didn't shoot poorly. They just decided not to be there. I lost one last year, that big one we tracked. I hunted this pig for like two months. He's huge. He's still out there eating dead. And he was at 17 yards not real alert chasing another pig around and he's huge and i'm like yahoo here we go and i wiggled and he waggled and i hit him about four inches behind the crease he didn't drop didn't do anything but he did do this literally just, just shot forward him. yeah mm -hmm. yep i think he was mid-step and then he heard something he just he literally just did that and went right just smacked through him arrow system didn't fail it was still sharp we went 10 yards past him even out of tree stand we tracked him blood for, oh, we went way down that hill. And he showed up on another camera two weeks later. He's not dead yet. And that I, like I said, I wiggled and he wagged. But he just, he didn't drop. He went like that. If he'd have dropped, I'd have had it. Because I'd hit high lung. What, because they're, they're, they have really stupid tall lungs. So I was aiming over here and then he moved and I shot right through his guts. And he didn't even. My, my buddy sent me a picture said, hey, hey, oh, he has a curly tail. <laughs> oh, curly tail. He, he don't like their feeder anymore. He moved about 400 yards to another guy's feeder. <laughs> <laughs> He's still running around. Wow. So it'd be interesting to know, you know, if you could play back the footage there, how close would you have needed to be? How close, to, you know, him relative to the feeder relative to you? Mm -hmm. How close would he have had to be to where he wouldn't have been able to get that lunge? Yeah, I think it was 10. I think it was... Arrow's about halfway there. I think once again, they constantly are eating, right? They're out competing, even though he was the big boss, he was pushing the other guy off. 
he was coming across and I think he was just, he was mid step and I didn't calculate that in the math. Didn't aim forward a little bit. And when I shot, he was already moving and he just, eep, you know, and four inches, four inches was all it was. It was that far back from where I am. And it looks good on camera. It goes zip right through him. Luminoc lit up everything. Nope. He laughed at me and showed his friends, right? That this idiot can't kill him with a boner. So it's so unpredictable. It's one of the great puzzles of this sport. I don't know where we'll solve it, but you can come up with some bullcrap theory, Barnett, and it'll right. be great. <laughs> but we, all, we have to start somewhere. Yeah, right. right? And uh, good job on the data set, Gary. That's cool. Yeah, it is really cool. We're, we'll spend some time looking through that, or I will. I'll spend some time looking through that, and I'm sure we'll talk about it offline quite a bit. And let's see what else we can match that up with. Maybe the data that your viewers send you. Yep. And let's uh, let's try to put something forward and see if it holds water. I'd I'd really enjoy doing that. I'm going to help the science out. All yeah. right. Yeah, it's good talking to you guys. Does that. Yeah. Yeah, you too. Have a great evening. You too. Talk to you guys later. See you later. Bye-bye.